So I really liked the way that the speakers this morning introduced themselves by telling you where they're from. And I'm from away, as they say here. So I thought I'd tell you where I'm from. I'm from Pottsville, Pennsylvania. And I was trying to think of the best way to describe what that really means in terms of, Pottsville's a really rich place, in, in my opinion. Not rich economically speaking. In fact, it's rather poor economically speaking. And I was thinking, you know, well, I could tell you it was the stomping grounds of the Molly McGuire's and where some of them were hung in the county jail located in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Or I could tell you it's the home of America's oldest brewery. Or I could tell you that we probably have more churches per capita in Pennsylvania than Vermont has farmers markets per capita. But what I think really sums it up is that Pottsville, Pennsylvania is the place where John McCain went when he thought he was going to lose Pennsylvania. And he thought that was the place where the swing voters were. And I think that pretty much says all you need to know about Pottsville, Pennsylvania. <laughs> so I'm here to talk about the local food in the village. And my question for you is, what will you eat if Vermont secedes? I think this is a really good question to ponder whether or not you support secession. In Mr. Kunstler's recent novel, World Made by Hand, which by the way, I highly recommend, food becomes a kind of currency after the governmental and economic infrastructure collapses. People in this story are forced to eat locally because they don't have much access to the outside world. Although secession is a much different scenario, it is worth considering what types of questions would need to be answered and what areas of the food system would need to be built up for Vermont to have true food security and even food sovereignty. In a July article in the Seven Days, Bill McKibben suggests that the secessionist movement should, quote, focus less on opposing tyr tyranny and more on counting calories. I would suggest to you that these two things are the same. We will not be able to count our calories more locally and regionally the way McKibben and I would like to do until we openly name and then dismantle the tyranny of our corporate industrial food system, which is supported by our government. And that's the whole government. It's not a party issue. Mr. Obama is just as bad on these issues as Mr. McCain is. In his article, McKibben listed a few of the many folks here in Vermont that are working to build our local food system. However, as he mentions only briefly, the State Agency of Agriculture and the federal government are, in the best cases, supporting these efforts with little enthusiasm, and in the worst cases, actively working to oppose efforts to build our local food systems. Earl Butts, the Secretary of Agriculture for Richard Nixon, reshaped America's food and agricultural policy when he urged farmers to get big or get out. Even before that, however, a movement toward consolidated industrialized food production was well underway. In 1906, Upton Sinclair published The Jungle, a novel that exposed corruption in the U.S. meatpacking industry. <clears throat> Although the novel's focus was on labor conditions in the slaughterhouses and packing plants, the book led to sweeping regulatory reforms focused on food safety. These reforms did achieve a certain level of food safety. It was a low bar where they started from. However, they also had a consequence of creating a system where small abattoirs and locally available meat are scarce because of the capital investment required to comply with all of the safety standards, which are designed to deal with the problems that occur when meat is processed quickly and on a large scale. A similar history can be found in our country's milk production system. In his book, The Untold Story of Milk, 
Ron Schmid shows us how competing interests fought to ensure the safety of our milk supply. Two doctors responding to the real safety issues caused by the Industrial Revolution came up with two different approaches. One created standards that certified farms to ensure the farmers and animals were healthy, the cows were on pasture, and basic hygiene and sanitation were routine. The other boiled the milk to kill any germs that had contaminated it. Because pasteurization had the added benefit of extending shelf life, it allowed the milk to be shipped greater distances, and the rest is history. Now, it is very difficult to process milk on a small scale, even if you want to pasteurize it, and even more difficult to sell it without pasteurizing it because of the regulatory system that is in place and the costs associated with compliance. In an October 12th open letter to America's next president published in the New York Times, Michael Pollan notes that, quote, after World War II, the government encouraged the conversion of the munitions industry to fertilizer and the conversion of nerve gas research to pesticides. The government also began subsidizing commodity crops, paying farmers by the bushel for all the, all the corn, soybeans, wheat, and rice they could produce. This eventually led to Butts' encouragement for farmers to consolidate and to value production and efficiency above all else, and thus to monocropping and petroleum-based farming. Pollan notes that we have a real opportunity right now because of a double crisis in food and energy. You've heard all about the energy crisis, but did you know, as Pollan reports, that in the past several months, more than 30 nations have experienced food riots. 30 nations are rioting over food. <clears throat> At this moment, there may be a chance to shift our policy and create a new food system. Michael Pollan suggests that we shift from a petroleum dependent system to one that uses sunshine, which he calls a new solar food economy. I agree with many of Pollan's suggestions, including expanding farmers markets, creating agricultural enterprise zones, developing a local meat inspection corps, establishing a strategic grain reserve, and creating a definition of food that focuses on nutrition rather than on calories. Pollan's ideas are good places to begin for America's new president. But what about us? Here in Vermont, what will we eat? What will our food policy look like? How can we work toward a secure and independent food system? I think we need to begin working on our state level policy right now, in the same way that Pollan suggests working on the federal system. Whether you want to secede and have Vermont be an independent nation, or whether you're not quite ready for that to happen yet, I would urge you to get involved in shaping Vermont's food policy. This past summer, rural Vermont conducted an online survey for consumers who were interested in local food. Over 200 people took the survey, and the overwhelming majority were interested in being able to buy local food and support local farmers. That wasn't surprising. One piece of data that stood out to me in the survey results was that the overwhelming majority taking the survey believed that the number one way to support local farmers was to buy their products. I strongly agree that this is an important thing to do if you want to support local farmers or any local business. However, I think it's also important to make sure that the policies that are in place encourage local production and processing on a reasonable scale and also ensure that the farmers get a fair price for their products so that they can make good choices for their farms, their land, and their families, rather than for their banks. Please remember, it is not illegal to buy many of the farmers' products, only to sell them. <laughs> you can buy all the raw milk you want to drink, but the farmers are limited in how much they can sell you. Same with me. And also, please remember that when you vote with your dollars, 